I guess uh, before I get started, like I'm here to uh, defend the honor of all SMC traders out there. So Raja Banks, if you're looking, man, uh, if you're watching this, leave my people alone. Welcome everyone to another Words of Wisdom podcast. We are back once again in New York still with Kyle, aka Jade Cap. Thanks for being here, man. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. My pleasure. And, uh, you know, what we like to do is just start off with you know, a bit about your journey. No, no doubt a lot of people do know you. And yesterday we did a roundtable, so it's a bit different. You know, normally it's the first time I'm, I'm meeting someone when I interview them, but we did the roundtable yesterday with Omar and, uh, and Paladin. But we're going to get this one out first so people know your story as well. And uh, yeah, so talking about that story, we'd like to just start off with your journey, you know, how you got to where you are today. And let me just take it from there. Yeah, so... I mean, some of your viewers probably already know my my story a little bit, but some don't. So I, I started trading back in 2011. Uh, I dropped out of college. I went to like a notorious party school. Mm. Uh, when I came back home, like my friend down the street actually got me into trading in Forex. Uh, he kind of just said, hey, come over. We were like trading currencies. And at the time, it was just like so new to me. I didn't mm. understand. Like, I mean, I understood the stock market, right? Mm -hmm. But at the time, I didn't realize like, I understood that you could go and exchange your money right at an airport or something like that when yeah. you go to the country, but I didn't realize you could, you know, actually make money off of that fluctuation, mm -hmm. right? Through through their use of lever leverage. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I got I got into trading back then. Uh, that kind of interested me in going back to school, so I went back to school for business administration and finance. Okay, uh, I ended up in construction. Actually, like I, I didn't uh, go to a great finance school, so mm -hmm. it was tough to uh, try and apply to like a top firm or an investment bank. So I ended up in construction, went through like construction administration and then ended up in like purchasing and estimating, which uh, kind of bolstered my trading a whole lot. And then, yeah, when the pandemic came around, I got like a taste of work from home life. Mm. And, you know, I guess some of the prop firms just kind of just started popping up on my feed. Uh, so I kind of started, you know, pressing into that and I uh, got funded at FTMO, got a pretty big payout, uh, saved up a nest egg and have been like, you know, full-time trading uh, for about a year and a half now. Incredible. Incredible. And, uh, you know, there's a lot to go through in that journey, no doubt. And I know you've done other you know, podcasts and interviews where you've talked about your journey in depth. So we'll try and touch on some new things today and different aspects, no doubt. But, um, you know, like in terms of the journey then, so if we go back to, you know, uh, finding it from school, like hearing about trading currencies. Yeah. Is there a case when you first heard that, did you think your friend was like sat there with like some dollars? And yeah, stuff? like I thought it was like a complete scam. But when I looked at it, look, it just looked like a, like a video game, like mm. just charts moving around and stuff. But yeah, 100%. It's completely new to me. You know? No, definitely. Definitely. And I, well, I, I bet it seems strange now, obviously, at that time being something that you never knew at all. And then now it's something yeah. that you do and, and create your whole life around. You know? Right, exactly. Cause, because if you just, you know, brush shoulders with somebody on the street and you mm. tell them about Forex, they're not going to understand it. Like it's going to take them months for me to explain to you like no, how to, you know, what the Forex market is, right? A lot of people think it's a scam, but how is it a scam, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the biggest market in the world. Well, so everyone's doing it anyway without even realizing Yeah, it. without even realizing it. I if you're going to another country and exchanging your currency, you're you're participating in the foreign exchange market. That's it. And you pay the highest spreads. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Scam oh, yeah. I saw I saw you had mentioned that. Yeah. Man, I, <laughs> JFK, I was like, okay, I just need to get, I just want to get some, uh, just a tiny bit exchange to uh, pay, uh, tip the driver. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I'll go to the desk. It was like just twenty dollars or twenty pounds, right? Yeah, twenty forty pounds. I'll do that. And I said, oh, what's the exchange rate? And she tells me one to one for the GBP to the USD. Yeah, yeah. I was like, what? Yeah, <laughs> and she, yeah. then I was like, okay, I'll just do it. Yeah. Like, get twenty dollars. And then she goes, uh, you'll get fourteen. I was like, why? Yeah, so the six dollar uh, fee as well. And I was like, it's like a thirty percent spread, man. <laughs> I was shocked. I was like, wow, you guys are killing it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You are the best brokers yeah. in the world. <laughs> You're like ultra B. Yeah. C oh, what you just made. <laughs> but yeah, that was uh, it's interesting. But it's, it's a weird thing because like before trading, you know, I'd be learning how to trade and learning about the markets. You wouldn't even think twice about the exchange. Yeah, you, know, you would probably compare it to another exchange rate given from another uh, sort of. Um, you know, like exchange off. Yeah, yeah, because most normal people don't under, don't know what the exchange rate is. Yeah. You know? Like if you tell them what the exchange rate is for the pound, they might think it's like $2 still. Yeah. You know? <laughs> the good old days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I remember when my family first traveled here and it was one or two and then like now, ooh, and then yeah. not even now, I came in uh, December. Yeah, yeah. Really dropped when the pound really sunk. Right. It was almost one, it was to, almost one. one to one, right? That was painful. <laughs> that was painful. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but yeah, hopefully we'll get the good old days back. I don't yeah. know. Well, it might not be good for you. No, no, no. Well, well, I need to travel right. to Europe now, you know, oh, before it goes up. 100%. So, like, in your journey then, so, obviously, you 
no doubt gone through different styles, mm-hmm. right, to get to where you are today. You've been trading a long time, right? Yeah, yeah, 2011. Wow, wow, yeah, so over 12 years. Yeah, over a decade. Yeah. It doesn't feel like it, but, yeah. Well, I bet I bet before it was working out, there was probably moments where it felt really long, mm-hmm. right? And you felt cause maybe there's some second guessing came in or like, Absolutely. why is this taking so long? Yeah. Like, maybe it's not going to work out. Maybe, not that it's a scam, but maybe no one can make money from this. Yeah, yeah. All these uh, sort of questions. I hear it quite a lot mm-hmm. where people message me and they're like, oh, risen five years in. I don't know if this is real. I don't know if I'm going to make it. Yeah. You know? And I, I understand it because I've been there. But it's like, I don't know. It's a strange one because obviously when you cross over into that consistency, as you say, it's like, then it doesn't feel that long. Now it feels like, you know, it's only been a couple of years right now. Yeah. So if for me, it just feels like I'm just getting started, mm. you know, I can imagine. Yeah. And it feels, it seems like it as well, obviously with, mm. with the sort of energy we were, we were talking yesterday, there's so much more growth. Yeah. You know, like everyone at that table yesterday, we had obviously ICT concepts, aka Kit, Paladin Omar, yourself. And even though essentially from the outside, everyone might say, oh, these guys are here. Yeah. It was very interesting because it's like, we're all, we're, none of us are talking as if we're here. We're all yeah. talking as if we're actually right. down here. And I think even when we hit more new levels, like we're going to still be looking up to some other people. Yeah, right. exactly. I think that's an amazing thing. And obviously, let's just talk about a little bit of your transition then. So in terms of your, your sort of education and, and, you know, your journey in that sense, where did you start off with and, and style you started off with to then transition to? Yeah, so I guess uh, before I get started, like I'm here to uh, defend the honor of all SMC traders out there. So Roger Banks, if you're looking, man. Uh, if you're watching this, leave my people alone. <laughs> uh, no, so yeah, <laughs> just uh, back yeah, back in 2011, it was the uh, the the stream of information was a lot different back then, mm. right? There wasn't uh, a lot of content on YouTube. There wasn't a lot of chat rooms. So a lot of it was just forum based, like mm. Baby Pips and and Forex Factory. So those threads are really still active. If you go on there, there's still people like posting charts and stuff. Mm. Um, but I kind of started out, you know, just trading technical indicators. Like we just had a, I think it was a 365, uh, a 50 and a 25 uh, SMA, mm. uh, you know, simple moving average. And we were just trying to trade crosses, you know, just a, a simple, you know, moving average crossover. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't think we, we were not trading it properly, obviously. Mm-hmm. Like the the moving averages were already crossed over and we're trying to enter a trade. I'm like, this looks great. <laughs> Uh, and at the time, you know, I felt like, oh, we have to just, fo- you know, just follow the system. We're going to make money. Mm-hmm. But we didn't realize like how much of, uh, an impact, like your, your psychology and everything, your money management hasn't, has an effect on your trading. Mm-hmm. No, definitely. And, uh, it's very interesting you say that because I feel like a lot of people have a very similar journey. It might be a little bit different now in terms of, because of the amount of information. Yeah. Cause like it's, when- it's easier to stumble into good information right now. Yeah, yeah definitely. Cause obviously back then, as you said, it was more threads. Yeah. You have to go and actually onto these sites, find a thread, go through that thread. Um, and there were really, there wasn't like YouTube videos, for example. There might have been, but not really yeah. easily found. Um, and like, as the years have gone on, as you said, there's more and more information. It's very interesting actually that, um, you know, I had a guy called Abdu on and he was basically explaining how, you know, the MFF stats that they put out, saying yeah. that, you know, in comparison to the year before, the stats of people passing has gone down. Right? Oh, wow. And getting payouts has gone down in comparison to the year previous. I wonder why that is. Well, the interesting thing is what Abdul was saying is that we have more information and quality information than we've ever had. Yeah. And what it essentially does is it's essentially creating like complacency in the traders, right? The traders just have so an abundance of information yeah, yeah. And, and knowledge. Mm. But because of that, it's creating almost like a laziness and therefore it reflects. Yeah, and they're getting like overconfident. Yeah. Uh, I'll just take the shades off. <laughs> that's for the Roger. Yeah. Well, I know Roger. you're a yeah, yeah. big advocate for the uh, the cage fight. The, the Oh, yeah, yeah. Fight it, yeah. So we'll have to do a face-off with yeah. Roger. Roger, whoever you want to fight, man, we'll set it up. We got, <laughs> we got some people lined up. I'm going to see him. I'm going to see him in a, in a few weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let him know. Maybe you can fight another uh, a broker owner, you know? That would be interesting. <laughs> yeah. We'll get IC Markets or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know who's behind IC Markets. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, so, like, I think that the abundance of information now is, is a very much a, a blessing, but then it's a, almost a curse in a sense. Yeah, <clears throat> I see it a lot. Like a lot of traders are overconfident in, mm-hmm. you know, smart money concepts. And really smart money is not behind like a concept in general. It's mm-hmm. like how people think, honestly, because I've brushed, I've brushed shoulders with a lot of people that are extremely wealthy, right? Mm-hmm. So smart money, in my opinion, is people that take calculated risks. Like yeah. they weigh the risks ahead of time. Uh, they have a plan going into something. And they can, you know, take advantage of the opportunity. Like it's really, uh, it's a whole different mindset shift going from d- what they call dumb money 
to smart money. So like I do, I do respect Raja because he's built a business, right? And that's not easy to do because mm -hmm. 95% of startup businesses fail, yeah. right? Same thing with the traders. So you know, a smart money is more than just, uh, you know, me giving you a concept or learning yeah. how to trade it, right? Like, because you have to shift your mindset from dumb money where people are, you know, those people type of people are like living paycheck to paycheck. Mm. They're not making the right financial decisions to put them in the, the group of smart money. Yeah. Right. So like if they're, um, you know, impulsively buying things or buying cars that they can't afford, like living above their, their means, mm -hmm. like you're dumb money. Yeah. That's you know? the, and, and kind of in the name, isn't it? Smart. Yeah. You, know, you need to yeah. be smart to mm -hmm. be, you know, to even start. It's the first word as well. Yeah. So you need to have that to then move on to the smart money concepts, yeah. for example. Just because you trade, it doesn't make you automatically smart money. Yeah. A hundred percent. And what's interesting is like your transition to smart money, for example, and that sort of ICT side, what was that like? Cause it would, it would, I'm imagining it was later on into your journey. No? Yeah. Yeah, it was because I was dumb money. Like I was delivering pizza, you know, I, oh, wow. I was, uh, before I went back to college, I was you know, on unemployment, like mm -hmm. just delivering pizza. And at the time, right, like that five, ten dollar tip means so much to you. Like mm -hmm. it really does. And you don't really know how to save it because you're, you know, it kind of comes and goes really fast. Yeah. Like you get that paycheck and uh, you get like kind of like a high from buying something, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm going to reward myself doing this instead of just like delaying that uh, gratification for something else bigger down, down, down the road. 100%. 100%. It's interesting though, because I bet it's a, a strange comparison then from going from like five, ten dollar tip being a lot and meaning a lot to now it's not that five to ten dollars doesn't mean a lot, but the the levels have changed. Yeah. You know? mm. And your experience and your you know level of income has now changed. It's very interesting because I was slight with the funding side as well. No doubt maybe at that time when the five to dollar uh, five to ten dollar tip was a lot, uh, a one K account would yeah. be a lot. Yeah. Exactly. Right? But then now we're talking, you know, 2.7 million yeah example, mm -hmm. you know in how much is it funded by the way yeah a little over 2 million yeah so like i had over over three but i lost in a, a big account with surge trader and i just haven't gotten it back yet that's <laughs> it. You know, it happens there yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll discuss that's that there's enough funding for me to, to make a living off oh, of you know? i can imagine <laughs> but the interesting thing is so like at that time it's like 1k yeah and then now it's like you could say 2.1 million yeah so yeah. then therefore that, that yeah that two that point one isn't even on that 1k it's it's a hundred thousand yeah yeah, so then the, the perception of mm -hmm. that money is still, you still value the money. Yeah. It's very mm -hmm. different now. How does that feel then to Some see people that? Some people just, uh, it's hard to like break through that ceiling, mm -hmm. right? Like, because when you get to a certain level, you, you might hit a plateau mm -hmm. and, you know, let's say if you only have $500 in your bank account, right? Now you go to a thousand. Mm -hmm. At times you don't really know how to manage that, mm -hmm. you know? So every time you level up, you have to find a way to manage it more, you know, more properly. Yeah. Uh, it brings on new challenges. Like I think that what they said was, uh, you know, with great you know, a great deal of wealth comes great responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that's true because if you have the same poor habits of spending, like it doesn't matter how much wealth you have, you're just yeah. going to destroy it. Well, it's like, it's like the lottery winners, right? You know, the people who, you know, win the lottery. Yeah, it end comes up, easy. Yeah, they end up broke in a few years. Or people who get a large inheritance yeah. end up losing it and squandering it all within a few years. Yeah. And it's that simple reason that they don't have the financial mm -hmm. principles or foundations in place. Mm -hmm. Talking of which, did, were there any particular financial sort of foundations or principles that you instilled to help you in within your journey? Let's take a break for a minute there, guys, because I want to tell you about our lifetime sponsor, Smart Funded Trader. Smart Funded Trader is brought to you by myself, Life of Paladin and Omar Aga. Just as I've taken over the podcast space, we are now here to take over the prop firm space. Smart Funder Trader has no maximum trading days. No maximum trading days. I know. It's insane. And that's how it should be. You shouldn't have to hit a target in a certain amount of time. So with Smart Funder Trader, you don't have to. You can take one month. You could take six months. It's no problem. The target is just eight. 8%. Can you achieve that in six months? I think you can. So you're probably thinking about drawdown. So you have 5% daily, but a 10% overall drawdown. 10% taking things up another level, as promised. You can also get max funded up to 400,000 with Smart Funder Trader. 400,000. And you can scale it to $2 million. $2 million. I'm blowing my own mind. <laughs> I swear. So we only have free minimum trading day. So free on the challenge, free on the verification, so you can get funded within six days. With Smart Funder Trader, you can hold trades over the weekend. So whether you're a scalper or whether you're a day trader or whether you're a swing trader, it does not matter. We are here for every trader. Now, I know you're excited to be funded with Smart Funder Trader. The incredible launch offer that we're doing here at Smart Funder Trader is going to be 15% off, 15% off every challenge. 
as part of that as well, we're going to give 90% profit split for those who do get funded, as well as 125% refund on your challenge fee on your first payout. So the link in the description is below. Type in your email so that you can be the first one to know. Part of that was me just recognizing, like, if I want to get ahead, I have to start uh, controlling my spending habits, my impulse, hmm. you know, spending, really. So I don't do I don't do a lot of traveling. Like, I haven't traveled internationally. I've been to Canada. Mm. But other than that, like, I've made sacrifices. Now I'm doing some more traveling. I have a lot of traveling planned this year. Of course. But, um, yeah, just shifting that mindset is really difficult. Mm. You have to have extreme discipline because, you know, you kind of get, um, you know, if you're, I guess if you're, if it, if it brings comfort to you in, like, buying things, materialistic things, or, or going on trips, like, uh, it's hard to get out of that lifestyle. 100%. Like if you're used to buying clothes every week, like it's harder to say, no, I'm not going to buy anything this week. You know? Yeah. It, it can be, it's like almost a, I don't, I don't want to say addiction, but it's like you build a habit and routine of doing certain things Yeah, and spending money is one of them. Yeah. And no doubt there might be even like when you buy something new, regardless of whether it's clothes, it could be food, you know, it could be anything. Yeah. It's like a dope, it's like a dopamine. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like, you know, once you create a pattern of that, your, your mindset then will struggle or at least put up resistance mm -hmm. to changing that. And that's exactly why you yeah. need to change. One thing I would reflect on, so like you said about, yeah, you haven't traveled or you've, you've controlled those sort of impulsive uh, buys, for example. You know, is it essentially a case where you know, there's the easy route of you're making money, I'll go spend, I'll go travel, I'll go buy this, I'll buy yeah. that, versus the hard route, which would equal to you enjoying later. Yeah. Right? So delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. Is that a case where just not even just with the financial side of things, but generally in life so far, you've realized that, the hard route, though it's the harder choice, is actually the one that leads to. It's like a, it's a fine balance that you have to mm -hmm. that you have to weigh because uh, life is short, right? You should go out there and travel and live your life and spend money on things that you want to spend it on. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, like don't put yourself at financial risk of ruin yeah. uh, because you're trying to live this certain lifestyle. Like if you if you can reasonably afford it and you know you can make it back mm -hmm. like pretty quickly, um, then I don't think there's any issue with it. But I think um, a lot of people are probably trying to try you know traveling too much or buying too many things right like it, it is a fine balance because you don't want to starve yourself of um you know rewarding yourself yeah right? no, definitely did you, have you done that in your journey obviously uh you may not have traveled but did you consistently let's say with payouts and with milestones being achieved in some form reward yourself well, reward your mindset i guess so my reward was really just reinvesting it in more okay. accounts so like I kind of delayed that gratification for a little while. Mm. Uh, I did buy a nice car. You know, that was that was pretty nice because mm. uh, where I'm from, I have to drive everywhere. So, uh, yeah. and, you know, for a long time, I was driving a really terrible car. Like, it was a, a Honda Accord that had 350,000 miles on it. Oh. Yeah, no bumper, like, no AC. <laughs> no AC uh, <laughs> and, yeah, I was driving that car uh, when I was working in construction. Like, I was pulling up to, like, multi-million dollar homes in this, like, <laughs> beater. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I was just like the guy, you know, working uh, for the for the company. Mm -hmm. I was like, uh, I don't know if I should be like, because I'm kind of representing the company, right? Like course, I was kind of yeah. working my way up the ladder. I was mm -hmm. like, ah, I can't look like a complete bum out here. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting because obviously, you know, a lot of people would have made that choice earlier on, you know, yeah, like yeah. as soon as they may have got funded. Because mm -hmm. at that point, had you start, started to get the funding? Yeah, yeah. Like, um... So I, when I got funded, it was like kind of like a whole year of me working still when I, while I was getting paid out. So that, you know, I, I set a goal when I started learning ICT. I said, I'm going to give myself five years to do this. So like with the ICT, yeah, stuff. with ICT stuff. So three years in, um, I felt really confident. And then mm. four years in, I got funded. So that, you know, fourth year, basically, mm. um, I was still at my job. I was, you know, withdrawing the payouts and building an nest egg, right? So I can okay. plan to go full time because that was always the goal. Mm. Like every step that I took. What was interesting though is that you say four years in, but that's four years on top of the- Yeah, four years on original. top of like the six years that I was struggling. So we're almost at the 10th. Yeah. Right? It's very interesting because mm. well, what's amazing about that is that not only were you giving yourself five years on ICT concept, that's after six yeah. years, Yeah. right? So while most people come into trading and they're like, I want uh, one year. Six months. Yeah. And it's not that it's impossible, but as we discussed uh, on the sort of round table, there are anon uh, anomalies. So there are yeah. these random people, you know, who get it yeah. in six months. Get it I think the, the thing is like with some of those other systems I was learning, I just didn't see the success rate. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't see people actually crushing it mm -hmm. or making, you know, a decent living with that system. So I would get really, uh, you know, I guess um, my confidence in it would, would drop and I would just go to something else.
Yeah. I saw a lot of times it was a one year studying this, right? Okay. In trading terms, that's not really a whole lot of time to learn a system, mm -hmm. right? So one year goes by, I'm not really making any progress. I'm just going to go to the next one. So do you think it was like the lack of example? Yeah. You know, the lack of example yeah. to be able to say, Absolutely. this person is using this method and it's really working for them. Not that it has to be like, you know, uh, crazy returns, mm -hmm. but you know, consistently we're drawing from the markets with this system, but with the lack of that image yeah. then just made it easy to say, absolutely we'll move on to that. I mean, I think people were, people were probably, and they probably still are trading those systems profitably, mm -hmm. but, um, the chat rooms and everything and journaling software, like being able to share a journal with somebody mm -hmm. that's only been like a recent thing, right? So a lot of traders back then were not sharing their actual executions and yeah. how the trades panned out. A lot of times they're just the entry and then you would never see a post from them again on the forum. Yeah. Like, and you can't reach out to them. Like you, you're posting on the forum too. Yeah. You post on the forum, you don't know if you're going to get a response or not. It's not like a social media yeah. DM. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's incredible though, because, you, mm -hmm. you know, seeing that change, you know, seeing that sort of shift in the land, in the space, you know, from forums to the way social media is now and you know, not even social media now, but like five years ago, for example, then mm, now. Yeah. You know, what's it been like to observe that that sort of transition? Honestly, like everybody has probably noticed it just with the pandemic, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. One, yeah, with Zoom and everything. Yeah, like Zoom wasn't really a big thing mm -hmm. in business until the pandemic hit. 100%. So, like, more people are comfortable using Discord or Telegram or WhatsApp mm -hmm. because maybe they started transitioning to that at work. Very true, right? Yeah. And they kind of got a taste of that, mm -hmm. and it makes it easier to connect with people. Like, people are not as nervous to reach out to some stranger online. Yeah. It is interesting because I think, like like I was saying, I said on my, what did I say? I think I said it on a, the vlog camera this morning. But I was essentially saying, like, you know, even at this stage, even though I've met a lot of traders and, I, you know, I've connected with a lot of traders, but still, nothing beats when you meet them in person. Like, yeah. I, I converse with a lot of traders. I'm sure you do as well online. Mm -hmm. But then when you get a moment to meet people in person like we did yesterday, nothing beats it. Yeah. yeah nothing beats it. And it's, it's incredible because it becomes, even though there's, like, there's, like, levels to it, there's you trading alone mm -hmm. by yourself. Then there's you getting into some form of community or just interacting with the, with the general community online, and then there's actual meetups. Yeah, and yeah, and you know, spending time with the real people behind those you know, profiles and those brands, if you will. And I think nothing beats it. That's why, I like with the FX Summit, for example, I know that you're going to a few other meetups as well. Mm. I think it's an incredible opportunity. Yeah, an incredible opportunity, and people maybe they don't see it. Because I think the the energy I've always gotten off the back of meetups, even when I'm the one hosting them, I the energy is very different. It's so inspiring and motivating because you are finally meeting other people on the same journey as you, and you are finally getting to converse with people who are going through the exact same, you know, different circumstances, but a lot of reoccurring themes. And suddenly, uh, a journey where you feel isolated and you feel uh, almost a victim, you realize, hey, everyone's a victim, yeah. essentially. So therefore, there's no victim mentality everyone's going through a similar thing and therefore i'd always sort of uh, recommend people to you know take action on hey if you want to interact with someone don't be scared some people might not reply some people might be you know uh, not, i don't want to say too big in terms of they the person might think they're too big but sometimes when you have a larger profile as you know it's there's so many messages so it might yeah. be hard to get through to them um but just don't be scared to do it yeah get out there get active and if there are meetups nearby like i would say fx summit wise if you're from the US, I can imagine other areas in the world it might be a bit harder. But if you're from the US, you should go because yeah. you know it's easier to travel to, and it's there in your backyard. You know, go and enjoy it. Same with like obviously, I know you're going to one in in the UK. Yeah, and, yep. Same principle. Like you know, if the, if you're from the UK, go to these events. You know, because at the end of the day, everyone always says they're so lonely they don't know traders. But then the yeah. events are happening. Yeah. So you have no excuse. Yeah, I mean, so I actually just met the first trader in person last weekend yeah, yeah like yeah. and that was an amazing experience i think um part of it is i think you just have to get comfortable getting out there and talking with people i mean i think a lot of people probably look at it and say oh no those are like you know scammy social media uh events or whatever you're not gonna learn anything from it mm. because they're struggling with profitability but that's what you kind of should be doing like if you're struggling so a lot of people are probably thinking if you're struggling with profitability, this whole market is a scam, mm. right? That's what they're po probably thinking, which is why they're not going to attend some of these events, Yeah, right? So uh, just, you know, try and get out there and actually meet the real people that are actually trading because there's there's people out there that, you know, have the same journey as you. Like they went through struggle mm -hmm. and they found a way to overcome that. Right? And you can get advice from them. 100%, yeah. And yeah, I think that's why the podcast is quite popular because that's the main thing people resonate with. Is that oh, this guy 
you know, had an addiction to weed, for example, or this guy, uh, you know, lost his parent or mm. this guy, you know, just blew 10 accounts before you got profitable, Ooh. for example. Like, and they realize, oh, I've done that or I've yeah. experienced that or I'm in that right now or something similar, right? Exactly. And then they're able to then realize, again, it's like, it's not me. It's not like the market's trying to attack me or life's trying to attack me. It's just the way life works. Yeah. You know, we all get our challenges in life and some are worse than others. And I, I don't think there's anyone in life who won't face something extremely difficult. Yeah. It might come early, it might come late, right? I saw a really good Instagram reel the other day. It mm -hmm. said that um, hard times make strong men. Uh, strong men make easy times. Easy times make weak men, and weak men make hard times. Like, it's a vicious circle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you have, you know, if you're raising, some, if you're raising a, a kid, for example, or um, if you're going through that period, right, like, put yourself in difficult times and, and kind of fight your way out of that because mm -hmm. that's what's going to make you strong, seriously. Definitely. If you're really complacent and you, you're looking for the easy life and you're you're making easy decisions, mm -hmm. like you're going to have a hard life. That's just 100% how it works. I know we talked about this yesterday, actually, in terms of, uh, you know, you're doing running and, and cold exposure, like uh, ice plunges, etc. Yeah. Uh, and one question, I don't know if I got to ask it yesterday, but I'll ask it anyway, which was like, what reflection have you read? Because obviously that's putting yourself in difficult times, mm -hmm. right? That, that's one prime example of you putting yourself in some form of adversity to strengthen your mindset. Uh, and to build your survivability, mm -hmm. you know, internally. But what sort of reflection has that done for your trading in terms uh, of... It's huge. It's huge. Um, but I think part of it is I got really comfortable with my job. So right now I'm like trying to reverse some of those effects. Mm. Like I didn't have time to work out. I didn't have time to, to actually focus on my mental health and do ice plunges or do long runs. Like I was just exhausted all day long. Mm. Um and I was comfort. I was comfortable just collecting that paycheck. Yeah. Because some days I could just slack off at work or whatever, and I'm, I know it's a guaranteed paycheck, right? So I got I got really you know addicted to that comfort. So I didn't want to you know work out every day or mm. you know do the hard things that really like helps your mental health. It re seriously does. Like uh, I haven't trained for this half marathon. Like typically you have to give yourself sixteen weeks. I'm, mm. I gave myself like five weeks, right? Because it's a huge challenge for me. I mean, I'm not in terrible shape. Like I can run like an average 11 minute mile, you know, mm. pace, average pace. Uh, but you know, when you're out there and you're struggling and you're like, you know, it's hard to uh, breathe and maybe you're dehydrated. Like yes. those are the, those are the times where your mind goes into a dark place and you want to just quit. Mm. But when you're five miles out from your car, you can't quit. <laughs> you got to get back to your car. <laughs> <laughs> at the very least. Yeah. At the very least. And it's, it's just like sharpening that mindset, you know, yeah, embracing yeah. that adversity. And um, I think, I love it. I think, you know, Everyone should try to challenge themselves, even in the smallest degree. Even if it starts small, even if it's not like a run, it might just be starting with cutting down caffeine or yeah, you know, doing a diet. You know, that's the thing is like a lot of people face that challenge and they just mm -hmm. quit and they just go right back to it. Yeah, right? that's like kind of what we were talking about with the addiction. Like, you're at, there's a deep root cause of you mm -hmm. doing, you know, having a specific habit. Mm -hmm. Like maybe you're addicted to shopping. Maybe you're addicted to I don't know eating eating poorly. Like mm -hmm. you're addicted to I don't know watching you know binge watching Netflix. Like maybe. A multitude of things, mm -hmm. uh, and it's hard to cut some of that stuff out of your life. Definitely. Have you ever experienced any sort of like addiction to things? Yeah, absolutely. Like I was a huge video gamer when I was younger. Really? Yeah. I love. I still love playing video games, but I, now I notice like it's a big time sink. Unless you're mm -hmm. doing it like as a profession, right? Because I was kind of just locked up in my room playing video games. My parents were always yelling at me like, "You got to study. You got to do this. Do yeah. that. Or you to do chores." Um, it was either that or I was going outside with my friends. You know, like. I was pretty much focused on everything else except for school. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So I mentioned it was kind of my escape too. You know, like my parents were yelling at me doing this. I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna play video games real quick. That yeah. way, nobody's yelling at me. How, did you, how did you curb that? How did you change that? Uh, honestly, it was just like I had to realize I had to actually go to work. Like, is um, you know, meeting my wife was a big part of it because when I met her, I was just a complete bum. Like. I, it was. I, I'm amazed that she was still with me because uh, at the time I was on unemployment and mm. you know uh, I had to go back to school because I was like, were you trying to trade at the time as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what was that like? Because in terms of partners, it's, it's a very similar actually story. Like with myself, when I met my wife, I, I was unemployed and mm -hmm. I literally but I had nothing, I had yeah. no income or anything. Yeah. So uh, same. Like I don't know why she's mm. with me. <laughs> <laughs> But um, but you need to find somebody like that that's gonna like stick by your side and like support you. What was that like for you? You know, like how how important was it to you to have a, a sort of a, a solid partner yeah it's a it's a big thing seriously um because she's never told me to stop trading or whatever like i've told her you know a couple times um you know i lost five thousand dollars here you know 
it's not really great. She's like, just keep going, you know? Like, um, I think she really real- realized, like, there is a lifestyle where you can actually make money online mm-hmm. by just clicking a button, right? Mm-hmm. And it's limitless. There's no ceiling. You know, there's no income cap to it. Mm-hmm. So as long as you have to find people, even if it's not a significant other, right? I said uh, this on, a, on another podcast. It doesn't have to be a significant other. Like, mm-hmm. surround yourself with family members that are going to support you. Yeah. Right? Like, I didn't, uh, my dad's side of the family was, like, extremely rough around the edges. Okay. Because uh, they saw me, like, kind of struggling in school. And, like, you're being a bum. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. Whatever. Um, now, now they, you know, respect what I'm doing, obviously, and support me. Mm. Uh, but at the time, you know, they give me a hard time, you know, and my mother's side of the family was like always supportive. Okay. You know, so like I got love from that side of the family and, it, you I know, think it was actually good. I think, both yeah, sides. yeah, absolutely. Because, um, my dad's side of the family, like that's what, you know, I guess, uh, thick into my skin, like I have an iron skin, mm. like, and my mindset is like, nothing's really going to break me and nothing really bothers me. Like when people... Uh, show negativity towards me like it doesn't really bother me because my dad was very negative towards me too okay so at the like, time was it a bit difficult to experience that and then oh yeah yeah kind of yeah he was definitely yeah verbally abusive and i can say that because he's not around anymore but oh, okay um like that kind of put me in a mindset where like all right i don't really care what you think about is that me. towards the trading or just generally just in general yeah yeah it wasn't really about trading um just in general uh because you know i wasn't I, I wasn't applying myself as much as he thought I could have, mm. right? Like, uh, I think he always knew that I was intelligent and were like really good with computers and stuff. I just never applied myself in the right manner. Okay. Right? Because like from an Asian family, you're expected to go to school, get good grades, get a good job. Yeah. You yeah. know, become a doctor or a mm. uh, scientist, something like yeah, that. Usually, you know? yeah. yeah. And then obviously going against that norm. Oh, yeah. Very difficult. And uh, so like, in the beginning, do you think the video games, as you mentioned already, it was kind of an escape to begin? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then obviously, was finding your partner. So when you found your partner, you'd obviously tried. You know, you were trying the trading, but at that time, were you still doing the video games as well? Uh, a little bit, not as much. Okay. Um, because I started getting more into like a career, so okay. I didn't have as much time. Yeah, cool. And even now, like I, I love to, you know, I, I kind of just delegate like an hour, two hours. I play with my brother. My brother's on. You know, I hop on with my brother like one time a week. And that's kind of how we stay connected. He's because he, he lives like in, in Philadelphia, so it's like a three hour drive for me. Mm. Um, but we do it like one time a week, you know. I'll dedicate like one or two hours to just relaxing a little bit. Cause like, I kind of wind down, you know. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like more so now it's actually like a reward. You use it as a reward. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because it's like people go to the clubs, for example. Yeah. You, know, you mentioned about going to a notorious party school, right? Yeah. So like when you went there, was it a lot of just partying? It was a lot of partying. Uh, with not a lot. Of, not for the no reason. Yeah, not yeah, not a whole lot of reason. Like yeah. uh, thirsty Thursdays, you know. It was <laughs> it was like almost every it was almost every night, you know. Yeah, like my roommate was trying to go to sleep, and we were partying on Thursday. He had class on Friday. We didn't care. Like we were just <laughs> yeah in there making a ruckus, you know. It's interesting though, because I know like I know that people do that, and 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 they get into that culture early on. Yeah, but uh, then they they they're stays stuck, with they're them. stuck in it. Yeah. yeah. It creates like a pattern of mm-hmm. the week, even if it's not every day, of yeah. course, it becomes the weekend. Yeah. You know, just with well, celebrating the weekend. You know, their, their social group then becomes that. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. So all their friends, if they're all going out at night, like yeah. you don't want to be the guy that's home, I guess, being the hermit, you know? Yeah. Inside. And it's so much easier than to justify doing it because you're like, we're all doing it. This is our this is our thing. This is uh, yeah. this is life. This is reality. Yeah. Um, hard to break away from that because you kind of have to like cut your friends off like yeah. that's that's where really what it comes down to you gotta just cut people off and just mm-hmm. say no i have to focus on my goals like i actually have stuff i need to do that's that's exactly what happened with myself probably with yourself yeah. as well. because it's the case of it's not like they're bad people the friends for no example. they're just yeah. living their life as you mm-hmm. were but then it comes to a point where you realize i want to do more i want to be different yeah. and the only way i'm going to do that is by changing and the reason you have to cut them off or not maybe not every single time so it's not like universal but most mm-hmm. of the time you do it's simply because when you decide to change, they will feel a certain way at- uh, about mm-hmm. you and they'll give you certain like comments and they will try to drag you in. Again, not because they're bad people. That's mm-hmm. just what they know. And plus, if you were doing it with them one minute and the next minute you've changed, mm-hmm. they are going to feel like, oh, what's happened with him? You know, or yeah. they're going to try and get you back. So that's why a lot of the time you kind of do have to isolate and then yeah. separate yourself. And it can be so like part of my friend group, actually, like we don't really hang out a whole lot, but mm-hmm. they've all gone off and like created their own careers and stuff. And they're doing, you know, they're doing pretty well. Mm. And honestly, like now when we meet up, it just means a lot more because now I haven't seen you in like a month. Mm. So now we get to actually spend a real quality time together. Yeah. You, you actually recap, like you actually get yeah, to talk. Exactly. What happened in that month yeah. rather than, oh yeah, last night, you remember when we went out here? Yeah. You know, or, or last week when yeah. we did this, Yeah. you know? So it's like, uh, 
yeah it mean it's more meaningful as you yeah. say you know and it's incredible to hear because i know a lot of people struggle with that that concept of isolation you know mm-hmm. they're a bit scared to take themselves away from their what they're currently used to and their you know normal routine right now some of it's addiction some of it's just uh that's fear of loneliness and you know i get messages a lot where they talk about you know i have these friends or family or whatever it may be and i want to change but what, what can i do i'm struggling and i'm always just like you just have to do it like there's no there's no like secret answer or like scalability you know de scale like a lot of profitable traders are uh kind of introverts at heart I think there's an element of introverts. I think like they ha- they go through a stage where they're introverted, but then I feel like you know afterwards, once they've gotten through that journey, they well some can choose to stay introverted. Yeah, but a lot do choose to be a bit more extrovert because that's they- kind of what I'm noticing now. Because yeah. last year I was just uh, at I, home, you know, but I was just grinding on my craft. Yeah, but now I feel like I don't have to work as hard because I kind of have that edge. I know what I'm looking for, mm-hmm. and honestly, when I'm sitting in front of the screen all day long, like it's kind of it's kind of productive for me. Of course, yeah, and I yeah. can imagine. So like. You know, when you were going through that journey of, of getting these payouts, right? Uh, no doubt. Was there a time when you were going, you know, trying to do challenges or funding, you know, a normal accounts like personal accounts and you're just blowing them? Yeah, yeah. I'm like failing. Yeah. Them. Mm-hmm. And um, pretty much like for four or five months before uh, I kind of hit a big payout at FTMO, um, I was completely gambling at that time. Like I still yeah. didn't have my risk management like down proper because mm-hmm. I wanted to leave the job. Mm-hmm. Like at the same time, I was saving money, like putting money away for the retirement and stuff. Yeah. But, a portion of my paycheck still was going to those challenges. Yeah, cool. You know, and I was trying to hit home runs off of that. Like I wanted to, you know, make a hundred K, a two hundred K yeah. off of like, you know, a hundred K, two hundred K account, <laughs> right? Which is like almost impossible to do. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, because you, you have to kind of think about it. Like, why are you trying to hit a home run? Mm-hmm. Really, it's because you want to leave your job. Yeah. So, you and quit. when you did get the big payout and get the funding, was it a case where you had made a certain change in the mindset and change in what you were doing or was it still like you did hit a home run and that managed to then... part of that was just me not caring about losing the money okay. like um just getting comfortable with yeah i might lose this money mm-hmm. um and being able to hold the trade that for a, a long time with size on yeah like that is really uncomfortable and that's an, ed- an edge in itself mm-hmm. like having the discipline and the mindset to hold on to a trade because a lot of people can't do it you know they get um it's the fight or flight Exactly. Yeah. How, how did you develop that though because i know that is a struggle that a lot of people have uh, honestly you just have to experience it in the market yourself mm. and be uh mindful of it mm. right like write your thoughts in a journal while you're in the trade mm. because a lot of times you're going to micromanage it if you're yeah. feeling scared or you know uh feeling greedy like you might you know might you might add to a trade when you really shouldn't be uh when it's going against you yeah. so you have to think about all those emotions that you're feeling in a trade like i there, there's nobody out there that can teach that to you yeah like i can't tell you all right go do this in a trade Mm -hmm. when you do it i don't know what's going through your head like when you put that position on i have no idea what's going through your head you could be thinking about a million other things right that's for you to experience that's part of your experience right so that's something that just it can't be easily transferred Mm -hmm. is this something that you build the tolerance for you know so it's like you're holding size maybe you hold it 10 pips the first time and you close it out the next time might be 20 Mm-hmm. my next time might be 30 and before you, you know, over time it might not be like years it might be for some but it might not be years if you're doing like as you say doing the journaling as well doing these different things that will help you to be more aware and self-aware of how you're operating and you know, how you're reacting but is there a case where it's like okay we're building that tolerance until it's finally you're holding it to tp let me just stop you for a moment there guys because i want to tell you about our other sponsor and i have partnered with and I'm very excited to tell you about this one, Trade Zeller. Now, as someone who's a trader and myself, I learned how important journaling is. Now, I only wish I had a software like this. Now, it is going to revolutionize the trading journey. I cannot wait for you guys to check out Trade Zeller. Trade Zeller is the most in depth automated journal I've seen. You can now connect with MetaTrader 4 and MetaTrader 5. So it's available for everyone, whether you trade options or whether you trade prop firms, or your own personal account. Now a task that everyone finds annoying, journaling their trades, which is yet so important. Everyone needs to journal their trades. They need the data, but yet very few people do it. Why? Because of the struggle. And that is what TradeZeller is here to fix for you. It goes into such depth into your trading and your statistics that you'll be able to see every element of your trading. If you want to have different strategies, you can create different playbooks. If you want to be able to review a trade, you can actually replay it so that it will show you the price action 
as if it was live. You'll be able to see the best performing days, the worst performing days. The depth is unreal. I am extremely confident that even from the beginner trader to the advanced trader, we'll find Tradezilla absolutely game changing. The level of detail that it will provide you on your trades is insane. Even things that I'd never thought of were available on Tradezilla. Suddenly you're going to be able to see the patterns and what you can improve to be the best prop firm trader possible. That is the Tradezilla team and that is why I am happy to be sponsored by them. Check out the code below, Riz10, for 10% off your Tradezilla subscription. The link is in the description and let's get back to the episode. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Um, and a lot of times, like, you don't have to do it that way. You could even think about it as far as, like, your your monetary risk. Mm. Uh, you start with a $10 risk and then mm. build your way up to $15, $20 risk, yeah. but you're still taking, like, 10 or 20 pips, right? You're just going to focus on the 10 or 20 pips because um, that 10 or 20 pips, it doesn't matter what size you put on, right? It's still 10 or 20 pips. So it, you could just literally size up and it's still, still the same trade. It's just how how does your mind react to putting on more size? Yeah, and I think it's something you touched on yesterday, which was like your A plus setup, you know, like your A star setup. And, um, you know, does that come, uh, an element of that come into that as well in, in terms of being confident enough to hold the risk? Is that yeah, I think part of that is um, understanding like what kind of mindset I'm in. Mm. You know, like if I don't get enough sleep the night before, if I don't get a workout in, um, you know, maybe I had an argument with my wife. Uh, yeah. There's a multitude of things that can kind of affect your mindset and how you're feeling uh, when going into the market. So you have to understand like, all right, maybe I'm not feeling the best this week. Maybe I'm tired or whatever the case is. Like maybe I traveled, maybe I'm kind of just out of sync. That's what a lot of people talk, talk about. Like I'm out of sync with the markets. Really you're out of sync with yourself. Like you're not out of sync with markets um, because that's what you're feeling at the time. Like it feels like you're out of sync with markets, but you're not really. Yeah. It's like, uh, I love that. It's, it's, it's something I described as like the domino effect, right? Where essentially... Same same example because it happened to me uh, a month and a half ago maybe. And I did a voice note in my Telegram and I basically said it's the domino effect of you know you might not sleep properly, uh, and then that knocks on to you having an uh, you know being heightened already and then having an argument with your partner or yeah. someone that then knocks on to you're trying to trade and you take a bad trade. Yeah, right? and then that then might knock into something outside of trading again, right? Or v it might be that the first you know domino is you taking a bad trade, taking a loss, and then that leads on to you having an argument with your wife yep. and so on. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, no, I love yeah. that. And uh, It could go either way, I guess, right? Yeah, what do you do in those situations, though, in terms of when you have, like, a, one of those domino yeah. effects, so whether it's a lack of sleep or, uh, you know, you maybe sometimes you just wake up in a bad mood or not feeling great or an argument with the partner, for example, do you still, is there a, maybe a process you take to neutralize yourself or do you just not trade? I just typically don't trade um, because I know if I'm going through that, like, one part of my routine is probably out of out of whack. Mm. Uh, and a big shout out to my to my uh, friend Rodrigo. He's like a performance coach. Mm -hmm. He always mentions like your routine starts the night before. Like you have to set yourself up for the next day. Okay. So if you're not uh, getting to bed at a good time and preparing yourself for that next day, like visualizing yourself taking a trade or taking a loss, right, you're going to respond. You're not going to be prepared to respond in the proper way. Yeah. Right. So visualize the the night uh, the night before or that morning you taking a loss or the trade going to your profit target and how you're going to react mm. because that is huge. Like if it's in your plan to uh, take the loss and just walk away for the day, mm. like you've already visualized it the night before. So it makes it easy to walk away. Right. right. But if you don't have, if you're not prepared to do that, now, you, now you're just in deep water and you're, you're like kind of, you know, a deer in headlights. You don't know what to do. Mm, I love that. And I'm glad you brought up Rodrigo actually, because I was going to ask you about that because you know, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on psychology, on the mindset. Um, and, you know, we talk about trading. So like just referring back to what you were saying there, it's kind of like imagine turning up to, you know, a, a big race, you know, F1 race or, or you know, a big you know, basketball game or a, a boxing fight and you're literally just turning up and expecting to win. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> well, versus, as you say, doing yeah, the preparation. It's all, the, it's all in the preparation. Yeah, yeah. So it's incredible. But essentially we do sort of relate trading to a high performance sport. Right. Yeah, we do. So having a performance coach, how is that, you know, what was the decision behind that? And then how has it impacted your trading? Yeah. So when I, um, I mean, I've, I've been good friends with him for quite a while. Like mm -hmm. even before I hired him as a performance coach, like I reached out to him and, uh, you know, he, he works for a city traders Imperium. Um, mm -hmm. I think you know, might know them. They're actually a firm that's based out of London, I mm -hmm. believe. So we've been talking for a really long time and we kind of just, you know, had like a, a friendship 
uh, you know, a friend relationship and mm-hmm. not so much like a student coach type yeah. thing. Um, and you know, I was, I was getting payouts and stuff, but I was going through really big periods of drawdown, you mm-hmm. know, and I was trying to figure that out. So I, you know, I, I hired him to help me out with like my mindset and how I'm feeling like through those drawdown periods. And, um, yeah, we t- kind of took it from there. But what I realized was, you know, he was giving me, he was giving me these, all these great tips, like doing a routine and things like that, your journal visualization. Um, but at the end of the day, right, it all comes down to what you're doing. Yeah. He could give you all the tips in the world. At times I wasn't doing them. Mm-hmm. Right. So I just realized, all right, I need to help hold myself a bit more accountable here. Mm-hmm. Like I was doing them just not as consistent as I should have been. Like, yeah. It was like three days a week I was doing it. And then the rest of the time I wasn't, but okay. you're not going to build a habit like that, you know, yeah. because the, the off days, you know, your cheat, if you have a cheat meal or whatever, like, let's say you plan a cheat meal on Friday. Yeah. Right, and then now you have it on Wednesday instead. Yeah. Right. Now you're gonna have it on Wednesday and Friday. Yeah. Right. So now you're breaking your routine, and it gets so easy to get thrown off track and start doing things outside of what you really should be doing as far as discipline. Hundred percent. How how did you sort of catch yourself though? How did you like? So you may have <clears throat> started off by, as you say, doing it in your two three days, and then slipping, two three days slipping. How did you make that shift to let me stay consistent at this? Um, I just, honestly, it was just really easily because, because yet I was just self-aware that I was not doing it. Right. A lot of people may, maybe not just, they don't really think about it a whole lot. Mm-hmm. You know, they kind of just like, eh, I'll just do it another day. Yeah. You know, it's like, like procrastinate it. Yeah. yeah. It's very interesting though. Cause I think a lot of people, I think, you know, when you were talking about going through that period of actually, uh, you know, being funded, but going through big drawdowns, would you say that yes, you knew enough to get funded? but you weren't really a consistent trader yet. Yeah, yeah. And that performance mm-hmm. work and you being less more self-awareness, taking action on what was being, uh, you know, sort of advised to you and actually putting in the work to, you know, to do that. Yeah. That's what made that shift. That's what I, so I talked with Angelo about that when I met up with him this weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about, you know, a lot of people think that some of the prop firms are predatory in their practices, mm-hmm. but in my opinion, if you have an edge, like it's actually going to force you to actually manage your risk better because Mm -hmm. if you don't, you're going to lose the account. Mm -hmm. Like in a normal environment where you have a personal account, like, yeah, you can go into 25, 35, 40% drawdown and still have the account. Yeah. But that's not acceptable. You know, like you shouldn't be going into those huge drawdown periods. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's pros and cons to it really. Uh, but I think, you know, um, prop firms coming along has boosted my performance because I kind of look at it in a different way now. Definitely. Definitely. In terms of prop firms, then, so like, obviously, you're, as we've talked about, seven figure mm. funded uh, and you know, consistent payouts as well. Have you got a personal account as well? Yeah, it's something I'm building up. Yeah. Incredible. But last year, we put a lot of money into our house, you know, so yeah, yeah. like, we're in, you know, we invested in, in an asset. So, mm. I mean, some people might think it's a liability, but, uh, you know, our, we definitely have a good amount of equity in the home, but it's something that, uh, you know, I'm, st- I'm stashing away for not only a personal account, but also, you know, other businesses and real estate right now, the yeah. real estate markets in the States are kind of crazy. So yeah, I think I'm kind of just, I'm kind of, um, you know, doing some research and sitting on my hands right now. It's just like a timing thing. Exactly. I, I, I like, I don't understand why people say you can't time the markets because that's the only way you can make money. It's the best way to do it. It's the only, like, if you time it improperly, like, you're going to lose your shirt. Like, yeah. that's just how it goes. It's that classic thing, isn't it? The fear and greed cycles. That's yeah. exactly what timing mm-hmm. the market is, you know, whether it's crypto, whether yeah. it's NFTs, whether it's proper. But some people estate. say you can't time it. You you can. You know, in terms of, like, real estate, for example, I know some people are like, I was put off by it but in one sense for a little bit because I, I grew up with it with my family. And uh, I was put off by, like, the rental side mm-hmm. really because of the sort of, I don't know if it's what it's like in the States, but in the UK, like they give all the rights and yeah. the power so to the in, in New York, it's, it's getting like that. Yeah. yeah. They're like loads of people just put off by yeah. it. They yeah. get squatter rights and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. However, um, someone said something to me once. It was very interesting because it wasn't someone like I, uh, you know, I knew it was literally just the most random conversation I had. And they said something that really just stuck with me, which is there's only an, a finite amount. So there's only a limited amount of land you can own in the world. Mm-hmm. Once that's all bought up and owned, yeah, that's it. Right. Right. So it's like, that's why, that's why simply just because of that. Yeah. That's why real estate makes sense mm-hmm. because look at, let's say Dubai, for example, you know, prime example, 30 years ago, it's a desert. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that desert, if you wanted to buy a plot of land of it, would have been cheap. Cheap, right? right? Mm-hmm. Now, uh, like, let's say like $30,000. Yeah. That same desert, depending where it is, mm-hmm. let's say the palm, for example, or, or near the palm 
or downtown Dubai, that's they're worth millions. Now. Yeah, and all you did was buy it and hold it. It depends on like where the location is, because like yeah. at my job, I worked at a private golf uh, course, mm-hmm. right, and it was extremely high net worth people, um, some high profile people, right. But mm-hmm. so like the land itself, half an acre, the land only was like two million dollars, wow. one point five two million dollars just for the land, mm-hmm. and then the house was like three and a half to five, yeah, and then the course membership was like a hundred k. Mm-hmm. But if you go a half mile down the road, you could buy an acre of land for like 50K, you know? So it's like 100X almost. So I, I think people pay for the location like as far as value. As if, yeah. You know, can, can you buy a piece of land and actually, I guess, have access to certain things, right? Yeah, no, 100%. Like you want to just buy land in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, right? exactly. But the interesting thing about middle of nowhere though is, is it's that same principle. Is that obviously you don't, you, there, are, there will be you know, factors you want to take yeah. into account, <laughs> but eventually everywhere is going to be built yeah, yeah, into a super yeah. city. You know? I mean, let's say if you're the investor and now you're the one that's going to create a housing development or a small yeah. city, right? Now you you are creating the value, it, right? Exactly. going to bring yeah. the value in. Because that's it with real estate. It's quite, in my opinion, it's quite a simple game. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's a lot of like, uh, you know, like red tapes and stuff. Yeah. But essentially, you buy a place. If you can see where you can add value yeah. and then resell or mm-hmm. then rent, that's up to you. But resell for example that's a very simple model yeah you know? yeah it's kind of similar in the markets like essentially you're looking at the markets and you're saying you're not in not in terms of like where you're adding value but more so what can i see that yeah. then means this particular pair is going to be increasing in value versus yeah. this pair. <clears throat> yeah like a lot of people got into trying to flip houses during the pandemic yeah if you're new to the game and you don't understand what value you should be paying for property like you're yeah. gonna go under mm-hmm. like um you're not going to be able to cover uh your liability based on what you're selling it for well, that's why, like, when we see these all-time real estate prices and mm-hmm. people, as you say, they're getting into it then. Yeah. And as you say, they don't understand the value. All they see yeah. is that all these, you know, this. Or the timing, yeah. They're yeah. following the herd mentality. They say, this is a great opportunity. Like, Every, everybody's doing it. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's probably not the best time to do it then. So the best, in terms of timing the market, like, let's say crypto, for example, or NFTs, the best time is when you start hearing your postman or your mom or your... Oh, yeah. <laughs> they start oh, saying, yeah. hey, what about crypto? No, my whole Facebook timeline was like, Dogecoin's at 72 cents. And funnily enough, that was like the high of the market. <laughs> there you go. As there soon you. as they parted, started posting screenshots, it was like a couple of days later, tanked. Classic one. Um, you know, and it's just the same signs, you know, same yeah. signs every time. Because... Um, the smart money knows... Human psychology. Yeah, the smart money knows to take the other side of the trade. Yeah. And that's exactly what you're saying earlier, you know, smart money. Because they're, they're acting in a smart way. Yeah. You know? They're talking about smart money. So they're just moving opposite to the herd, you know? That's it. That's it. And that's not easy to do. Yeah. You know? And that's why, that's one of the I main mean, reasons. It requires you to just think differently than everybody else. That's that's all it comes down to. And that's why it's hard. You know? Yeah. That's why most people struggle because <laughs> yeah. they can't they can't do that. Well, it's not something natural to us. Yeah. But then they, they struggle to go against it. Yeah. I think not only that, now social media is like, now they're molding you, like they're feeding you ads, mm-hmm. they're feeding you this whole feed. And now it's like shaping your thoughts, right? Interesting. So, that's what it's called, though, isn't it? Yeah, feed. You know, mm-hmm. very, very. Interesting. Oh yeah, yeah, very interesting. And it's like obviously you're consuming this content, mm-hmm. you know, that consumption again. It's interesting. Language is very powerful. You know. Yeah. I remember I see like certain clips taken from some. I don't know what it is, but then they they're breaking down words. You know, I think there was one like awake, right? And you wake in the morning, but then awake is also something you do when someone dies. Mm-hmm. You know, or mortgage is death pledge, mm-hmm. right? So, like, you get a mortgage, obviously, real estate-wise, is actually, uh-huh. you break down the word, it's mort and then gauge, mm-hmm. and that's it, it's a more, more, uh, death pledge, um, right? So, <laughs> it's, it's interesting. insane. And then, like, with, uh, yeah, yeah. in terms of finance, we talk about liquidity. You know, a lot of it's, it's around water. Mm-hmm. So, like, liquidity, banks, like a bank of water, you know? Um, your channels. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's really, really interesting, and uh, I wish I knew more. <laughs> I wish yeah. I knew more. But um, Something to look into. Definitely, definitely. It just goes to show, like, this. Even something so, as simple as words, you can you know, do a deep dive into, you know, language. And they, and though you might not think it would make an impact in your life or trading, the reality is it can really shift certain perspectives once we have a deeper understanding. Because all we know is we've been taught that oh, these words mean this and this does this. And in reality, we can actually, you know, be a bit more intentful with how yeah, we speak and right. everything. It's like me, I used to be, very, I used to actually have a lot more of a posher way of speaking. And then I started hanging around with certain people and I picked up a bit more like street uh, language and stuff like that. Yeah. And my mom always was like, I'm so disappointed. <laughs> I raised you. With Honestly, I'm from New York. So like it's it's normal for us, mm-hmm. right? Like it's part of just the, uh, I guess the, uh, I don't know what they call it. Um, and the culture. The, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like cursing is normal, you know. Yeah. Just drop yeah. F-bombs left and right. 
It's not bad. It's not bad. <laughs> good, good, good emphasis on the words. But in, ter- uh, in terms of uh, smart money, right? Mm-hmm. So in terms of smart money, uh, you know, you, as we talked about, you said five years and then dedicated yeah. to the ICT concepts. During that time, so I think it's a reasonable time, right? I think, yeah, yeah. especially considering that you're already six years in. Mm-hmm. But it just goes to show that that mindset of willing to you know, take on this new concept as a fresh journey is that what the mindset you had towards it? Yeah, yeah. Like I, I looked at it like almost like schooling. It's mm-hmm. like professional sports. You wouldn't go out and challenge somebody that's a professional at some a specific sport if you weren't an expert. Yeah, like you can't go out and just assume that you're going to be on the NBA court with some of the top players. Yeah. You know, because if you only can shoot free throws, like most people can shoot free throws, right? Mm. A lot of people can't dribble. You know, a lot of people can't take a three-point shot mm. or, uh, you know, pass, precision pass. Like that's the mindset you have to take when you're going into trading because you have to have all these skill sets. You can't just have one thing. Mm-hmm. Like you can't just be uh, really good at execution. Like what's execution without risk management? Right? Yeah. What's execution without psychology? Mm-hmm. Like you have to have a full skill set. And what does that mean? That takes time. Mm-hmm. Like when you're looking at it, all right, it's regular schooling. Think about it like if you're a surgeon. Like you're not gonna, they're not going to put you into a surgery room with a scalpel, and you're not going to be, you know, operating surgery the next day. But that's kind of the access you have to markets. Like it's so easy to sign up to a uh, brokerage and just take your first trade. Yeah, right. Easy access, very very easy access. You know, and uh, in regards to that, then obviously, I hear a lot that ICT concepts. There's a lot of concepts, right? Mm-hmm. There's, I think, maybe a hundred of them. Yeah. As an example, right? Um, and you know, what was it like in your journey? Was there a case where you started off by like learning all of them? Yeah, and just it's not. It's not the best way to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, like you want to be an expert at just a couple of them first, mm-hmm. and learn it. Like learn the ins and outs of just a couple. Like mm-hmm. the Fibonacci. I, when I sat down with the ICT, actually, I said, the Fibonacci. You don't just take the Fibonacci and put it on a chart, and all of a sudden you understand it. You mm-hmm. know, like you can't just draw one swing projection out, and now all of a sudden you're an expert at it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's the same thing. You got to take a hundred, you know, ten thousand free throws before you come become an expert at it. Yeah. So like back testing and, and studying the Fibonacci tool itself is going to take a long time. You mm-hmm. can't just get it in a week, right? Because there's certain nuances, like there's certain ways that you use it to your advantage mm-hmm. that creates an edge. Uh, you don't get it just from just because it's available to you. Of course, yeah. So, like, how, what was the process like of finding the out of say the hundred that you then, you know, the handful that you then resonated with? Was it a case of just like these are the ones that make most sense to me, and I've seen play out in the market personally, and therefore I'm going to choose those? Yeah, uh, and it's really what I became comfortable with. Mm. Like, I just trade fair value gaps mostly. Eighty mm-hmm. percent um, of my trades, you know, just fair value gap. <clears throat> but that came with back testing, you know. Like, I tried trading turtle soups. I wasn't really comfortable with them. Like, uh, I guess a run on stops, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they all make sense to me, right? Because I have a bigger understanding of narrative behind it, like yeah. why the market's moving certain directions or why it's going to certain levels, mm-hmm. like who's being trapped on what side. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that kind of builds a narrative for me, but I'm not using that as my signal, right? Yeah. It's not, I'm not using it as my setup because it doesn't make me comfortable. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair enough. And it's a... Uh... It's interesting because I think a lot of people, as you say, they and you did it in the start of yours, is like you're sort of learning all of these different concepts, right? And the, and the reality is that you know for it to work, you gotta go for what you know, makes sense to you. As you yeah. say, you can understand things. I think not only that, like what has the high strike rate and what's paying you, yeah. right? That mm-hmm. don't change. You don't if it's something's working for you, you're making money. <laughs> like just because it's boring, don't change it, right? A lot of people probably get bored and they want to change something. Yeah, you know, I actually talked about it with Angelo because he spoke about it. Because he said some of our traders, right, they go from profitably scalping or swing trading euro, right? Yeah. And then the next month, now they're scalping gold. Mm-hmm. But why are they doing that, mm-hmm. right? Like, you made money last month doing one thing. Why are you doing this now? Do you think it's uh, sometimes social influence? So one is like you said about being bored and then trying something different. But do you think another one is seeing other people doing something? And maybe. It's like they're like, killing it. Yeah, maybe they're trying to find the magic bullet, which doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Right? The silver bullet, I guess. Yeah. No, because I've seen people where they've got results yeah, yeah they're, they're looking for something where it's just easy in terms of like mm-hmm. do you come to the market and say you know because you're consistent and you're you got the high level funding do you ever come to the market and you're like i know 100 percent this is going there and then there and then there never 100 percent like you know have a you know confident feeling yeah. narrative like my a plus setup i feel like 70 percent confident on mm-hmm. right yeah which but is you not, like, I would, I'm always expecting I could possibly take a loss on a trade. Like it's mm-hmm. all, the risk is always there. Yeah. It's always there. Perfect. So Whatever I felt like I, it was going to be a home run setup. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they look like home run setups, right? Uh, 
sometimes they just come back and stop you out. Like, it yeah. looked great at the time, but, uh, you know, the powers that be, you know, didn't allow you to to hit your tar- your targets. 100%. 100%. So it's not a case where you usually still feel confident in your setup, but you're not there thinking <clears throat> you can essentially play by play. Say, yeah. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. Because mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of traders out there believe there's something out there that they will eventually be able to learn that they can come to the market and ping pong the market whenever they want mm-hmm. at any time they want just by looking at it. Yeah. Uh, Maybe they can. Maybe they're the outlier. Again, the anomaly, yeah. But um, I think as we talked about that, that's like the, you know, as let's say the statistic of say 1% of traders are winning. Mm-hmm. The anomaly is then 0.01% of that yeah. percent. Like you should always be trying to, to get to that level. Everybody wants to get to that level because mm-hmm. they don't want to take losses, mm-hmm. right? Like so there's always something to strive for. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, you should be aiming, trying to get the 100% strike rate. Like mm-hmm. who wouldn't want to get the 100% strike rate? Just don't assume that you're going to get it. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's striving for perfection, but not thinking you're going to be perfect. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, 100%. And then going back to sort of the ICT side of things and smart money side of things, like as you've seen you know, many times over now, probably more recently as well, yeah. with everything going on, on on social media, you know, you see these people who turn around and try and say that, you know, because ICT trades, uh, doesn't trade live, uh, well, he trades live, sorry, but doesn't trade on a live account that, you know, his concepts don't work or like he's a fraud or, you know, he's just yeah, trying yeah. to trick people. Um, you know, but then as someone who has used those concepts to get seven figures in, in funding, to get large payouts, funding your personal account, investments, et cetera, et cetera, off the back of this, you know, off this person, mm-hmm. right, who's being attacked and, and is in the, the firing line, if you will, quite often. What are your thoughts when you when you see these things? I just have the utmost respect for him, the way he handles it, because at the end of the day, it does, who cares if he's trading demo or not? Mm. Like if you're my, if you're teaching me, and I know you have a system that works, I don't need to see your bank statement. Mm-hmm. Is it working for me? Is it going to put money in my bank account? Mm. Like that's that's what matters at the end of the day. Like as soon as that money started rolling into my bank account, I'm like, all right, this is the real deal now. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if uh, you think that he's trading on demo or not, Mm -hmm. right? And what I said on another interview, if you put, I think I I said it to him, if you take a trade on your demo account and take a trade on your live account, Mm -hmm. like if you get stopped out on your demo account, you're going to get stopped out on your live account. Like my my master account that I use to manage all my accounts is just a demo account. Really? Yeah. It's interesting. That's very I have a personal account uh, tied to it, like- the data feed is the same unless there's going to be a, a massive, uh, you know, broker slippage, yeah. right? Which you just can't avoid it in general. Like exactly. the risk is always there. Mm. So, in terms of that, it's an interesting one. So, do you do do you do that for any particular reason? Maybe psychology wise? What's that? Using the demo to to do the the, uh, the copy. So, just because I can on trading view, like I can hide the P and L. Like I like trading directly on trading view. I don't know why MT4 hasn't like updated their app. Mm. Uh, it's been the same since like 2011. I don't think they've made any updates to it. There's then you the, use TradingView and the way yeah. you do it is by using the demo. Yeah. So TradingView has a built-in risk calculator, Yeah. which is something that a lot of brokerage platforms don't even have. Like, mm-hmm. they won't tell you how much we're risking, which is, to me, is like a retail trap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like, even, like, major brokerages uh, won't tell you, like, if your stop loss gets hit, this is how much you're going to lose. Like, yeah. they, don't, they won't tell you that. Mm. It's very interesting. No, definitely. Is this, I think a lot of people are going to take that away because they're going to yeah. be like, mm-hmm. never thought of that. Um, so then that's really good to hear. So, like, it's so interesting though, as you say, like for me, when I observe it, because I haven't like watched any of ICT's content, uh, yeah. content, for example, obviously I trade SMC mm-hmm. and we were talking about this last night where it's like, you know, I've learned SMC, but I didn't even hear about ICT for years yeah. after that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and then I come across him and it's like, I'm the founder of SMC, for example. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, how did I not hear <laughs> you know it? But um, it's incredible to see though, because I've always said like, I have no opinion essentially like positive or negative in terms yeah. of like, you know, I, I've had people on the pod like Raja, for example, and I've had like Sam KB on and, and mm-hmm. you know, they're not fond of ICT. They don't like him necessarily. Um, you know, they say it's all a lie, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, I'm just someone who is just talking to people. So I just, okay. And then I try and present the other side mm-hmm. or try and ask questions about it. But for me, um, you know, when I observe, whatever I observe is like, there's someone here who is just giving out, and now anyway, is just free information. Yeah. Consistently, right? right? And, uh, you know, there's so many people who are saying it's helped. I've met now yeah. countless How could you say it's a fraud if he's doing it for free? Exactly. That's one aspect. And it's not even like he's doing it for free and then trying to say, hey, join this broker. So then you get a payment. Yeah, it's not, like, it's not like these prop firms either are, like, paying us. Like, yeah. I mean, they're paying us with payouts, but mm-hmm. I earned it. Yeah. Right? It's not like they're saying, I'm going to give you 10 grand. Come interview with me. Yeah. Right? They're not doing that. Yeah. Exactly. And then, uh, 
that's what I find interesting though, because then I, I obviously speak to you know yourself and then Paladin and Omar and uh, Omar, you know, and all of these different traders who trade SMC or have literally been a chartered member, and they're doing very very well. Mm-hmm. You know, they're doing very very well, and it's not a case where they literally just jun- uh, learn ICT and then suddenly within a month or two. You know what I think it is the way that he teaches. It just it puts everything into context, mm. like how the market actually operates. When I look at a chart, to me, I always think about like an order book, mm. you know, like what, which orders are going to be facilitated at what prices. Because okay. I always looked at like the floor traders and stuff. That was kind of my inspiration back in the day. I was like, mm. I want to be as close to that as possible. Okay. What people don't realize, like the people on the floor were probably making the most money. Mm. You know, like some of those traders were trading huge size. Um, and I was trying to get as close to that as possible. I just didn't know how. Like, I, I didn't think they weren't doing it with moving averages. They didn't even have a chart in front of them. Yeah. You know, they were just looking at people's emotions and they knew where that guy's stop was. Mm-hmm. And they're like, all right, we're going to go run that guy's stop out. You know, like if you came into the pit, they're going to look at you and be like, that guy's like fresh meat. Like, we're going to go and take his money. Like, there's literally, that's how they're thinking. Interesting. Right. Yeah. So that's why it's like, it's- so yeah, just. He put everything into context for me. I don't know, mm. you know, I'm not going to argue if he's the author or not, right? Like, he even gives credit to some people where he learned from, like mm. Linda Rash and Larry Connors, um, his, their Street Smarts book. But, like, it to me, it doesn't really matter. I don't really, I'm not going to fight him over, you're not the author or not. Yeah. I don't care if he's the author or not. Like, I'm getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> Just helped you. That's all that matters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 100%. I know that you talked about, we talked... Uh... A few times of the mystical Dante. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, was that another source of uh, you know good knowledge for you? I Absolutely. I came across Tom Dante when I went on Twitter. Absolutely. And now, yeah, and to me it's amazing because I was always watching his videos and stuff, and mm-hmm. he was somebody, somebody that just kept it 100% real. Mm. Um, and now I like he reached out to me and stuff, and I talked to him like via DM. And to me it's like I'm like almost starstruck, you know? Um, but at the same time, like a lot of traders are just normal people yeah. like, at the end of the day. And like, I noticed that when I met high profile, ho- high profile people at my job too, Yeah, a lot of them are just normal people. Uh, uh, a lot of people just get scared when they get, come into the room and they feel the presence of that person. Yeah. Right? I know you mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he was a huge resource to me. Like I always look up to people that, um, I want to be in their position, Yeah, you know, like, and I tweeted about it, like, the Market Wizard series book for me is huge. Like, mm-hmm. a lot of those people, they they started, they were trading at a time where social media wasn't a thing, right? Mm-hmm. And some people you didn't even know about. Like, I think Reminiscence of a Stock Operator was a good thing, mm-hmm. a, a really great book um, that I could recommend to your viewers if they haven't watched, uh, read it. Mm-hmm. It was about, uh, have you read it? I haven't read it, no. So, it was about a stock trader, I think, back in the early 1900s or 1800s. Okay. Um, and he was just reading the tape, basically. Uh, and he went through huge P&L swings, like massive fortunes and then lost it all. And then unfortunately ended up like ending his own life. Oh, wow. um, so like I was, I mean, I looked up to people that were trading size, but that guy was, a lot of people at the time didn't know who he was. Yeah. Like he was just doing it. Right. And a lot of people that I look up to are kind of, I guess, legends or industry titans. Yeah. That are, they're not on social media flexing. Yeah. Right. But reading through those books right a lot of them trade different markets they trade different styles but all of them have like a really strong mindset and a will yeah. around them so there's like reoccurring themes yeah there's reoccurring themes even if they're trading different markets yeah. which i think you know, like your podcast and like chat with traders like all those platforms i listen you know when i was at my job i literally had headphones on listening to chat with traders i was probably you know extremely distracted from work but <laughs> that was like that was kind of my resource at yeah. the time because I didn't have time to read or look at charts, right? So, like, yeah. audio yeah. was big for me. So, like, making it work for you, so still being able mm-hmm. to gather knowledge. Yeah. And if it's in a unconventional, what most yeah. people consider unconventional in terms of, like, it's not on the charts or it's not like a course. Yeah. But instead, it's still tapping into the mindset, which you've... And, and, and experience, like, yeah, I think we talked about last night, like, if you're going to... You're not just paying an educator for the content. Yeah. Like, you're paying somebody for their experience, You know, like, how much would you pay to get in a room with David Goggins or Tony Robbins, right? Like, some people, I think, I can't remember who it was. Maybe, I think it's Gary Vaynerchuk, I think he said. Or it might have been somebody else. They pay, they have Tony Robbins on, like, a retainer. They pay him, like, 50K a month, right? It's just huge. Like, but if he's going to provide that much value to you, Mm -hmm. like, just having experience uh, given to you, right, is is priceless almost, right? It's not, I mean, there are scammers out there. Like, Mm -hmm. we're in a industry where it's easy to scam people yeah. but we're in a, in a market where you know you can make fortunes so obviously you're going to attract uh bad apples yeah that's true what's interesting what you said there though is like 
in terms of uh, when you are leveling up, the best of the best still will invest in. Well, I didn't mean to do, to wrap it out there. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but they will still invest in terms of like things that will improve them. Yeah, you know? like LeBron James, I think he said spends like multi millions of dollars a year just on upkeep of his body. Oh, he needs it. Yeah, saying, yeah. Right? And uh, well, what about yourself? Is there anything that you're doing now in terms of investing into to still the, keep the the tools sharpening and, and to still level up? I guess not, not like monetarily, but like my health and stuff. That's yeah, a major yeah. thing. So like a big project that me and my wife want to do is like turn our laundry room and put a sauna and a cold plunge in because nice. the ROI on that to me is like priceless. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So I'm always looking at things like that. Like yeah. I have a whoop bracelet on. I'm always tracking like my heart rate, my sleeps, you know, so all those performance things like going back to being a performance athlete is so important. So investing into those things. Is there anything that comes to mind in terms of like a particular sort of coach or mentorship or mastermind or anything like that? Um, No, I mean, there's a lot of good resources out there. So I don't really have like a one recommendation over the other. You know, you yeah. kind of have to find mm-hmm. somebody that's real, that, that's legit. Mm-hmm. I mean, you kind of, that's kind of on you to do dil- due diligence on yeah. and understand like, all right, I should listen to some reviews that people are saying. Yeah. You know? But are you open it open to it? Obviously, in terms of if it, if you feel it's going to be beneficial to your yeah, general journey, yeah, exactly. Because I've spent a lot of money on education. Like, yeah. How much do you think you spent so far? Over the course of my career, probably over twenty thousand dollars. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it goes show because yeah, you know, you've probably seen people where they're reluctant to spend a mm-hmm. hundred dollars, five hundred dollars. You know, which is crazy to me. Like, you can't run a business like that. Yeah. Especially a skill set, you know, like the just going to lease a, you know, just going to lease an apartment or you renting out the studio is a cost to it, right? Yeah. But people think they can get everything for free. I mean, you can get. There's a lot of free resources out there, right? Yeah. But there's nothing wrong with spending a little money for something that's a little more premium. Well, that's it. Like, you know, you see the argument people try to make is like, you know, uh, why should you know you make money from trading? Why do you need to charge? Or, um, you know, why should you know? I don't want to invest into you know five hundred dollars into a course or. Uh, whatever it may be so like you know what do you say to those people because you know i've I've never had that issue i guess myself. the thing is like now uh because i have uh some vis- visibility mm-hmm. now it's like all right and my time is valuable right my inbox is absolutely flooded with people asking me uh questions that i could easily answer through content or they're asking for mentorship you know like one-on-one mentorship or a private discord channel yeah so like how do I avoid that? The, the the demand is there, and I can't answer everybody's questions because a lot of questions are just uh, repetitive. Yeah. Right. So, if the demand is there, like, just, yeah, take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, trading at the end of the day is really boring. Like, if you're not, you know, if you could change somebody else's life, mm-hmm. and they're gonna pay you fifty dollars a month, hundred dollars a month, right? They can make that back tenfold, mm-hmm. and now they're saying like, wow, you changed my life. Like that to me is more, um, it's more important and like fulfilling than just trading and clicking a button yeah. and it's just me in my dark office, right? <laughs> like it's me in my dark office, like, all right, I made ten, twenty thousand yeah. dollars, you know, in a month. But what does that do for somebody else? You know, like how how can I go out and help somebody else? Yeah. No, it's so true. You know, it's so true. And I think it really comes down to the mindset of the trader. You know, I think the the ones who will succeed are willing to invest in themselves. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean they have to, you know, like some courses we've seen in the past, you know, some of the when it when there was a lot less options. They would be able to obviously charge because they cornered the market. They would charge thousands upon yeah. thousands. So I can understand the reluctance there. You know, obviously, if it's someone who's real, of course. Let's say if it was like, um, I don't want to maybe use that. Maybe let's say ICT or, or Tom yeah. Dante, for example. They have this wealth of experience, wealth of knowledge. They have all the the receipts to back it all up, and they said, "I want to charge ten thousand dollars." Yeah. Day. You know, they could be justified in doing so. Versus. On the other side of things, where if it's like a lifestyle market, there isn't really too much substance, maybe a lack of experience, and they're turning around trying to say five pounds, yeah, for example. It's different. I can understand. I mean, so I guess the thing is, yeah, it's kind of on you. Like, you're the one making the business decision to give this person money. Yeah. Right? So I uh, I think, like, a little bit after COVID, right, there was all these documentaries popping up on Netflix. Mm. It was uh, a lot of scammers. Like, uh, I can't remember what it was. It was like Bad Vegan was one of them. There was another one. I can't remember what it was. It was like the guy that was scamming people through like dating apps and stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I can't remember. Right. Yeah, yeah. But like, oh, his name. you're, you're, the one you're, would be like, the enemies are after you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I can't remember what the guy's name is. It's Simon or something. Yeah, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, you're the one making the decision to give that person money, right? So, uh, you know, business owners take L's all the time. It's mm-hmm. just the way it is. Like they're not, they're not putting too much thought into it. Yeah. Do you feel like, uh, in essence, you know, I remember when I first started and probably similar when you first started, there was a, 
there are a lot of people would say it quite consistently in terms of only risk money you can afford to lose. Yeah. But I feel like over recent years, I don't hear that sentiment as much. So like you see all these people losing money on challenges and, and you know brokerage yeah. accounts, etc. Uh and and maybe even getting scammed, you know, mm-hmm. through fake profiles or courses. But they're risking money they can't afford to lose. Yeah. So then they wonder why they like that value still holds true. It does. Um and some of the best like venture capitalists will say, I'm gonna lose on nine or eight out of ten investments. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's like a twenty or thirty percent strike rate. You're just trying to find the unicorn. Yeah. You know? It's interesting. You know, it's interesting. People are always trying to find that holy grail, find that one thing that's gonna yeah. make the difference. But yeah, again, like you have to be willing to lose that money. Like you shouldn't be trading with money that you're you can't afford to lose. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you don't want to lose. Yeah. You have to understand the the element of risk in the game that we're playing. So, for example, like I wouldn't turn, I personally wouldn't turn around and say that I know a hundred percent that I'm going to be still trading the, you know, at least in the way that I'm trading now. Uh, you know, when I'm four years old. Yeah, yeah. Because things might change. Yeah, things might change, but also it's just like at that point in terms of the wealth that's been made. Do I want to still be risking through the mm-hmm. you know the the financial markets mm-hmm. in because essentially the financial markets though we control our risk yeah. in terms of risk tolerance is very high. Well, risk. That's, that's why they call us speculators. Yeah, you know that's why we're high risk speculators. That's it. So then you know after those years after you've gone through that journey and you have extracted from the market and then you've reinvested elsewhere, is it fair to say that you will still be you know, happy with that you know that risk size in comparison to, to I've already extracted all of this money. And now I've got these investments that are low risk, but yield me enough, you know? So yeah, like, the thing is, that, like, maybe you're going to shift into doing speculation in something else. You know? Yeah. Like, you're going to speculate on the real estate market. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's interesting, though, you know, because this is why, you know, someone I had on the podcast, Elliot, um, and he said, basically, like, he doesn't believe in five-year plans, for example. Yeah. Essentially, just meaning that nothing, you, know, you can't predict what's going to happen. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I believe that. Yeah. I, I can agree with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because like, you don't know, you, you might have a very thick, you know, he said, have an idea of where you want to go. Mm, right. But you can't be fixated. Yeah. Because, right. you know, an opportunity might come and if you're fixated, you might turn down an opportunity that's actually going to help you grow further. Yeah. Um, and I found it very interesting because when he first said it, I was like, oh, you know, I, I like to have plans and stuff. Yeah. But then when he explained it, it made uh, a lot of sense. So it was very interesting. No, like as traders for me, I don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. <laughs> A lot of people don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, mm-hmm. so. No, it's true. It's good to have a plan, though, mm-hmm. and work towards that goal, but don't, I guess, focus too much of your attention on something that you can't control. Yeah. Right? The only thing you can control is, your, like, your decision-making, like, your how you're feeling at the, at the current moment. Um, you know, it's basically everything that boils down to is, like, how you react. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, you know, in terms of, like, the holy grail of, you know, people searching for that one thing, my opinion has always been that, uh, you know, the holy grail in trading is actually the small details, you know, mm. little small things that when tweaked and changed and then worked on, that leads to the overall growth and change. What about, what's your opinion? Yeah, I agree with that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not the flashy, like glamorous way of doing it though, which is why people can't do it. Okay. You know? It's interesting though. <laughs> but I think we're coming towards the end now. So I'm going to do some quick fire questions. Yeah. We've got about 15 minutes left. So it's not, too, it's not exactly the end yet. People get worried. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, what was uh, rather? I know last time we did like top three and then stuff like that, but I'm gonna do a little bit different now. So, I think I didn't get. To, did I ask you yesterday? I don't think I got to ask you because we're waiting for today. Which was uh, the first one I ask everyone, which is if you can meet anyone, past or present. Uh, yeah, past or present, still uh, famous or not, and you could just spend time with them. Who would it be? Oh man, I think I would have to say Michael Burry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the big, big short, big short guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. how come? Uh just because he's like a really big trader and what at at the time like he had so much confidence in mm. the specific trade that he put on i love the big short i mean there's a couple people honestly it's hard to say right for yeah. me like there's a bunch of people i would love to meet like david goggins is up there are you gonna make that happen jocko willink is up there like 100 oh, you know yeah. um there's a lot of people I would, I would love to meet you know definitely but it's interesting that was the yeah. first one that came up you know? yeah um but yeah, he's interesting right now because he keeps like going on to <laughs> tweets of and deleting it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> scaring everyone. Yeah, like, I'm sure this. I'm sure he yeah, ever. No, no, yeah, yeah. He's an interesting character, man. But I maybe he's just trying to generate the interest, and he's taking the other side of that. You know, <laughs> this is true. This is true. You know, with um talking about that, you know, like the Big Short, for example, or Margin Call. One thing when I watch those films mm-hmm. is like, you know, everyone always like trade like the institutions, trade like the banks, and when you watch those films, you realize that they don't know what the hell they're doing <laughs> either. You know, have you seen Industry? 
I haven't yet. Oh, you should watch it. There's a, uh, yeah, this one girl, she starts working at like a foreign exchange firm. Yeah. And she's trading through NFP. And, you know, she goes, you could see the emotions on her face. I'm like. Is it she's like chewing gum or something? Yeah, yeah, chewing gum and she doesn't have a stop loss on. It's good. And she's got the wrong position on. Mm. And she's like, no, the news is just going to press, you know, it's going to push it higher. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it went up just a tiny bit and then they took, a, the firm took a huge loss on it, you know. Yeah. But just uh, seeing her emotions on screen was like so real. You know, because, yeah, maybe those are the type of people that are actually at the institutions I think that are so. trading, you know? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I was talking to uh, Ken Shigbo. He, he used to work mm -hmm. in, a, uh, like, a firm uh, and he'd be on the trading floors. And he was saying the same thing, like, there's people who, yeah, there's, there's people who kill it, but there's a lot of people who just don't know what the hell they're doing, you know? And I think you were discussing yesterday where uh, that story from... Um, oh, yeah, Tom Dante, right? Yeah, yeah there's someone... the one published author right the yeah. guy was uh yeah he was extremely nervous in his trades and he only had like a one lot on mm -hmm. you know you would think somebody that's like you know that's what i mean don't put people on a pedestal right because you don't know what they're actually doing yeah exactly right? put yourself on a pedestal right like you're trying to get to that point exactly no i love that because i i always say the same like look i don't you can imagine i have all these different people on the pause from raja banks to you know yourself for example you know, shout out roger banks <laughs> yeah, that's, it, that's it but it's like the kind of two opposites in terms of like the the styles and maybe opinions and certain things um and then i get people who are always like oh you know you shouldn't get that trader on or you need to get this trader on or this guy's not real or that yeah. guy's fake but then the reality for me is like look it doesn't matter because you take what you learn and take yeah. what you you know can help you and remove all the rest. And as you yeah. said, don't put them on a pedestal. It's kind of for you to decide, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. you're kind of providing the medium where I'm going to just bring this person on and ask them hard questions. Mm -hmm. And now, yeah, like, and it's the same thing with when you're making a decision in business or in life, like, mm -hmm. that's on you to decide. Like, you have to come up with that opinion of somebody, mm -hmm. right? Like, you shouldn't be uh, taking somebody else's opinion as automatically you know, judging somebody based on what this person said. That's it, yeah. And the similar in the other side of it is like, you know, regardless of what they show, whether it's a payout, whether it's a withdrawal, whether it's profits, again, like you said, pedestal one. Just yeah. don't worry about it. I honestly give a lot of people the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. You know, until, you know, I guess innocent until proven guilty. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And it's like, just, you know, we, we know there's so many ways you can fake things or you could be doing yeah. it legit. There's no point putting weight in it because it makes no, that part makes no difference. As long as you're not scamming me, you know, I don't know. Yeah, that's it. I don't know. You know, as long as you're not like, you know, as we talked about earlier, just not doing your due diligence and throwing yeah. money at people just yeah. for the sake of it. Um, and at the end of the day, it's about why focus on, okay, this guy's got, you know, showing this much money or whatever versus yeah. what words did he say yeah. that I can take away? I think the words are way more. Like he's not the one that took, logged into that bank account or that yeah. PayPal and sent him the money. You know, like yeah. you're the one that did that, you know? like hold yourself accountable to that and like yeah that was a part of me um you know just become a pizza delivery guy and like do, um, bagging groceries like mm. i could have blamed so many other things but when you look back at it like those are the decisions i made yeah. right like i put myself in that position yeah and like it's on me to change it you know? definitely yeah, but talking about that actually it's an interesting point you bring up there because i don't know if it's uh maybe a new sort of trading mindset maybe it's because of the rise of social media maybe it's uh you know the rise of sort of like andrew tay or any of these sort of things but i over the years you know over the last couple of years i constantly do get messages of people like oh i can't work i can never work a job man i'm you know i'm too good for a job or i hate jobs and you know and then yet you you know you've sat there i've done the same i've worked in like places that people would consider bad jobs or whatever yeah. just because i had to yeah and you've mentioned you know bagging groceries and doing pizza delivery right what mindset did you have in terms of being uh having the humility to just do what was necessary versus obviously these new guys who seem to be just like not willing to put in any work i mean i guess part of it was that i just became extremely un unhappy with where i was mm. like so in order to change that you have to find the outlet mm -hmm. right and for me that was i mean it's not going to be the same answer for everybody like yeah. for me going back to school like i luckily found landed myself in a position where like yeah now i started doing purchasing and estimating where my contracts, like I was buying out lumber and the lumber package was $150,000, yeah. right? Whereas the next, uh, the next vendor was $125,000. Yeah. So it was a $25,000 swing. Yeah. So I can see that in a P&L, right? If it's not my money, it's not like I'm sweating over it. Yeah. You know? So that was a big thing, but you know, my journey is not going to be the same for everybody out there. Like it's, I, I would say it's really hard to try and find your niche at something mm -hmm. because you kind of have to press into it. Like maybe... You are stuck at a job that you hate, right? It's a really it's a reality for a lot of people. Like, just 
I guess put yourself in a position where you can go out and take a risk and maybe try something new. Yeah. Right? And part of that is like finding a way to not have to live paycheck to paycheck where you're uh, relying on that job now mm-hmm. to pay you because now you have to show up to that job mm-hmm. and then you're going to resent every minute of it. Of course. All right. So like, I guess my question to you is like, how did you find your way out of that? Right. Out of the, the job. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So for me, it was like, I, I remember I said I met my wife yeah, and yeah. I was like just a bum and I had a bit, a little bit of credit card debt and mm-hmm. I didn't really have a, any sort of a plan of where I was going to go next. But the reality is that I put a little bit of uh, money into an account after I got married, ended up blowing that account. So then I had to get a job. You know, yeah. I had to get a job. Obviously, I didn't want to. Obviously, that wasn't my vision, especially after getting married, you know, and telling my wife, like, you know, I'm going to be entrepreneur, I'm going to be successful, mm-hmm. and then having to humble myself. But reality is I had no choice. Yeah. You know, I was expecting a baby at the time, uh, my daughter at the time, and um, I had no other choice. I had to uh, go to work. Yeah. I had to start. I-, I chose a job that allowed me to still try and trade, right? Uh, so I was doing, like, night shifts in a chicken mm-hmm. shop. And, uh, you know, I kept funding the small amount of money that I would, extra that I would make. And it were, essentially, it wasn't really extra. I should have been saving. More. Yeah, same here, same yeah. here. So I was putting that into an account. I kept blowing the account. Mm-hmm. I was trying to trade, as you, we talked about earlier, trying to trade like 100 into thousands. Yeah, yeah. Thousands into yeah. tens of thousands. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't work. Yeah. Ever so often, I'd do a run, you know, and you'd, you'd think it's impossible. It can work if you're extremely patient and you're okay mm-hmm. with the gains. Like, yeah, that's it. Well, this is the thing. 4% a month, 3% a month, you know. If you're doing it properly, right? Yeah. But that's but like, like, what, 30 bucks, you know? So it's like you're spending so much time, you're on a $10,000 account, you're going to make 30 bucks. You're like, ah. <laughs> that's it. But what, what I did was I had a, I think I'd blown an account once and it had $10 or £10 left in it. Mm-hmm. And I flipped that in a couple of weeks to free grand, right? Wow. £10. Pounds. <laughs> and exactly. So I was like, yeah, yeah I, mm-hmm. I'm a killer trader. I yeah, can, yeah, yeah. You know, I can now take this free to 10 and 10 yeah. to whatever. And, and that's just so an easy mindset to give into just because mm-hmm. you got essentially lucky in a sense. Yeah, you might be doing yeah. analysis and you might be trading, et cetera. Um, but what happened to that free? It's not, a, it's not a long-term edge. Yeah, what happened? It's gone. Yeah. You know? So what took maybe two, three weeks to build up, gone in yeah. a day or two, yeah. you know? So um, Like flash in the pan success. Like, yes. It yes. doesn't last very long. Right? That's it. So after that period of time of doing that for a while, um, it got to a point where I was just making stupid financial mistakes, right? Finan- financial things that as someone who was married and then had a child at the time, shouldn't be making. because, yeah. Especially because I was the only one working, for example, bringing income in. It made no sense. It was it was selfish of me to make these sort of decisions. Yeah. It changes the narrative when people rely on you. Yeah. And that was the shift. Mm. That was actually the shift of yeah. me changing from that mindset of, uh, you know, work the job and just try and try and make trading work versus right. work the job, build the financial stability. Yeah. And then work on yeah. your trading. It's a completely different mindset work. shift. Yeah. yeah. So then that's when I started to look at, as, you, as we talked about earlier, the different compartments of trading, yeah. risk management, my technical ability, mm-hmm. my psychology, um, you know, and I started to break it down. And then I started to to journal more, you know, uh, my thoughts, you know, because yeah, that's what I, that's the thing is like journaling your thoughts is more important than journaling the trades. Yeah, right? the stats are are important, mm-hmm. but journaling your thoughts are more important. A hundred percent. And talking on that in terms of like you know advice to people, because I, I sometimes throw out the questions um, on like Twitter or Instagram mm-hmm. and say like you know if you were to speak to a you know a successful trader, what would, what would you ask them? And the common ones are like, you know, what would you, a common one like this. So if you were to go back in your journey, what would you do to, you know, make it the most efficient journey, if you will, mm-hmm. and, and to get to success? Or what would you do different? I think I would stop focusing so much on the technicals. Like I spent, I just can't remember who it was. It might have been Pal and that talked about it yesterday, mm-hmm. uh, where you're just so focused on technicals because you think that's the holy grail. Mm-hmm. But it's that's really not the holy grail. Like the holy grail is up here. Yeah. Like I could probably find another system and trade it profitably just because I have the edge up here. Mm. Right. So focus on uh, your thoughts and your emotions. That's the biggest thing. Like if you're feeling nervous or anxious in certain situations, like um, you can, you could definitely, I guess, shift the mindset of like the environment that you're in. Mm. Right. Like if you, ha- if you're around a negative environment, like you could think positive thoughts and kind of take your, take yourself out of that situation. Okay. Right. So to me, that's a huge edge is like, if you're struggling right now, um, you know, just focus on how you're thinking about certain things. You know, do you feel, um, I guess, do you feel jealousy when you see somebody driving a nice car, right? Like, is that something that triggers you, mm. right? It's all these like emotional behavioral triggers. Like, so if you feel a certain way, it's going to trigger a certain behavior. Yeah. Right. If you're feeling, um, I guess desperate, like it's going to trigger 
over leveraging. Yeah. So it's like being that self aware. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. Understand. Which is hard to do. A lot of people aren't self aware. They're not self aware of what they're doing. They're just like on autopilot. Do you feel like the journaling? Because I've I've felt this, but do you, do you feel like the journaling? is what is like the easiest and the first step to being more self-aware yeah it's easy and hard at the same time i don't do, do you watch ufc um yeah yeah uh sugar sean o'malley i watched a podcast with him i think he was on the pivot podcast and he talks about like his evening routine he said he journals and cold plunges every single night he ha- absolutely hates it but that's something that like puts him in flow you know you get you get comfortable in your breath and understanding like how you're feeling at certain you know certain moments and that's so important What's that David Goggins, man? Like, even to this day, he does, what does he do? He does, like, two, three hours every night of stretching. And oh, meditation. yeah. And then he's doing, like, 50 miles a day running. Yeah. Like, like, how, do you time, how do you have time for anything else? Like, six hours, eight, six, I think it was, like, seven to eight hours of pure, like, just stretching, meditation, and working out. Yeah. Because he does the running, and he does weights as well. Yeah. But, see, in order to do that, you have to cut something out of your life, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of people are comfortable just watching Netflix. Mm-hmm. when they get As soon as they get home, turn the TV on, mm-hmm. you know? I've been there. Yeah. yeah, I've been there, man. Which is okay to do on certain days, right? Like, I'm not saying that you have to just do hustle mentality and just do this every single day of your life. Like, because at the same time, you want to enjoy your life. And if you try and do too much, you're going to burn out. And like, yeah. burnout with traders is a real thing. Like, I'm sure you experienced it. Like, when you're trading and trying to uh, you, manage you, a you, manage you, a no. full time job and stuff, you're going to burn out because yeah. that's you. You're literally trying to study on your free time, and you probably don't have a lot of free time. So, yeah. Understanding like when you're hitting that threshold of burnout, just take a break. Mm. You know, like the markets are not going to go anywhere. 100%. I mean, if they do, we have bigger problems to worry about. <laughs> you know, true. very, very true. Actually, yeah, good point. And um, we'll finish up with one last one. Finish up with one last one. So another one that people do ask about is stuff like, um, let's think, which one should we go for? Let's go with uh, in terms of getting funded. You know, obviously you've been through the journey of trying to get funded, failing the challenges. We did talk already about how you, what you did to, to have mm-hmm. that shift. Again, going back or advice to others out there who may be going through that now or maybe about to tackle their first challenge, for example, what would your advice be to them to make a success of it? I would think the first thing that you have to actually evaluate is if you're actually ready for the challenge. You know, like if you've been trading, you actually have to have an edge like i would say a proven edge over one or two years like i I was trading for eight years before i touched a funded challenge Mm -hmm. that's a long time right so uh you're trying to compete with a lot of top traders like you're competing against algorithms you're competing against like the top people in the world Mm -hmm. so you can't just approach a funded challenge like a casino Mm -hmm. so my biggest thing is um because all of the parameters for any account size are all the same Mm -hmm. You got to prove yourself at the lowest size. Yeah. You know, or if you can afford it, right? Like you can go for the bigger size, right? Mm-hmm. But prove it to yourself, right? The percentage of people that actually make it a payout, extremely low. If you get funded, trade at the smallest size possible and prove it to yourself that you actually do it before you start sizing up, yeah. you know, which is a big thing. It's hard to do, but you're trying to treat it like a business. If you can do it profitably with an edge over three, six months, nine months time. Yeah. Now you can start sizing up and actually seeing the fruits of your labor. Yeah. Like everybody wants the fruits right before they, I guess, plant the seed, right? 100%. No, I appreciate that. And I think a lot of people can take note of that. Hopefully they do. Because uh, again, we don't want people just listening for the sake of listening. Mm-hmm. You know, we want people to be taking action and actually, you know, reflecting on what they're, they're hearing and then the lessons that they can learn. But I appreciate you coming, man. It is a pleasure, man. Yeah. Excited to get out of the episode the round table the first this is the round yeah. table actually <laughs> uh the first round table that we did with uh paladin and omar right. oh, that was an incredible mm-hmm. episode i think one of the, you know a lot of people are going to enjoy that and uh hopefully the first of many and uh we'll be seeing each other obviously again yeah. at the mm-hmm. fx summit and then even in london I'm yeah UK. yeah i'll try to make you're it out busy. to your studio you're busy you're active yeah. man um and then hopefully great. we can organize the the prop for a fight night man it's happening. Yeah, Kyle is the promoter. <laughs> That's it. Kyle's the promoter. We're going to make it happen. But I think, literally, we just have to take action on it. If yeah. you want to make it happen, we just have yeah. to take action. I just need to find the right people to help me out, you know? I'm, I'm just, I'm just a guy, know. you know? I'm just a normal guy. Well, I'll start doing it. I just got the idea, right? So. All right. What we're going to do is, the next guest that I come on, every time we get signed, I'm going to say, Look, Kyle wants yeah. to sell up a fight. Are you down to fight? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'll start yeah, getting Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Man, it was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to have in the description below, obviously, the links to, to anything that related to Kyle, uh, a.k.a. Jade Cap. So uh, whether it's socials or anything else that he has going on. So make sure you check that out. Check the other links out in the description as well. Make sure to comment and 
subscribe, of course. And until next time, take care.